Diary of Fate. Fate plays no favorites. It could happen to you. Book 82, page 509. Yes, here it is. The life record of John Hayne. A record tainted with clever compromises, shrewd lies, and elaborate infidelities. Yes, you, John Haynes, have devoted all your talents and energy to the fraudulent means of gaining your own selfish ends. And now for a moment, I, fate, look ahead to an instant of horror in your numbered days. God, God, come here. Get your hands off me. Have you lost your mind? I'm going to my cabin. Well, why, you... Come on, get up. Well, we'll see what's so special in your cabin. Why, look at this room. The chairs. The smooth. Hmm. If you want to see John Haynes alive again, it will cost you $50,000. You will be... Very, very well, Gordon. John, John, you fool. You'll never get away with this. That, my dear brother-in-law, is only one man's opinion. Yes. In the life record of John Haynes, a murder was committed. Then I, fate, intervened. In the end, it was a little thing. A stray cat that determined the final outcome. But remember, you who listen, I, fate, am but the instrument of a plan. And in a moment, I will read again from the diary of fate. Before the unusual story of John Haynes, here is our announcer. John Haynes, it was a spilled drink and a stray cat that spelled doom. Remember where it all started? You were waiting at the airport for the arrival of a plane bringing Nancy Keith from Chicago. Nancy? Huh? Nancy, here I am. Oh, hello, John. Been waiting long, darling. Oh, seems like years. Hey, wait a minute. Yes? Better. The car's over here, Nancy. Oh, good. I'm tired out. Well, how are things in Chicago? How's any fashion show? They call it the new look, but all the model ever sees is the same old look, believe me. <laughs> oh, I detest the idea of other men ogling you, Nancy. We should quit modeling. Quit? How can I? I've got to make a living some way till you decide what to do about your wife and that crew she lives with. Uncle William and dear brother Gordon. Well, don't forget it, won't you? I'm not forgetting. Uncle William holds the strings of a very fat family purse. So where does that leave me? Oh, please, Nancy. Let's not talk about that now. We've got the whole afternoon together. Afternoon? What about tonight? What about dinner? Well, I, I have to be back at Bayville tonight. What? I mean, the very first day I'm back in well, town, I you have... I can't help it, Nancy. Uncle William's getting suspicious. That old story of mine about roaming around to get inspiration for my paintings is a little threadbare these days. I've got to be careful. All right, John. Just don't be too careful at my expense. What? What do you mean? I'm in love with you. I want to marry you. I'm not going to spend my life waiting. Think it over, John. When you're out in that mansion at Bayville tonight, give it some good, serious... Ellen. Oh, Ellen. Oh, hello, Uncle William. So the great artist finally decided to come home, did he? What happened? Get hungry? Where's Ellen? Sleep upstairs, nerves again. If you'd spend more time with her, young man, maybe she'd think of something besides her health for a change. Where have you been? 
Making sketches at Ramshead Point. And where are the sketches? They weren't right, so I threw them into the sea. Oh, splendid. Now, if you throw the rest of that stinking clot of yours into the sea, we'd all be happier. Look, Uncle William, I don't like working here at the house any more than you like it. If, if there were any other there place... There is, I... there is. I just thought of it today. The Lady Grey tied up at my pier. There's nobody on the yacht now, and you won't be disturbed. I'm having a painted next spring, so your sloppiness won't matter. How's that suit you? The yacht? Why... That's fine. Just fine. Yes, John, you were careful not to show your anger in front of your wife's uncle. Because of the money he controlled. As soon as you left the house, you called Nancy and asked her to come out to the Lady Grey. Then, two hours later, as you sat in the luxurious main cabin of the yacht, a drink in your hand, she listened attentively as your real feelings boil to the surface. Nancy, I'm at the end of my rope. That old man's going to open his mouth just once too often. Well, frankly, John, I'm surprised he hasn't kicked you out long ago. Oh, that's easy. I'm Ellen's husband, and dear old Uncle William will do anything for her happiness. You'll never get dressed. You like all this luxury too much. Listen, Nancy, you're the most important thing in the world to me, but I'm smart enough to know we've got to have money. I'm going to leave this outfit. But when I do, I'm taking plenty of cash with me. And just how do you propose to do that? Insurance. Ellen's insurance. It's all made out to me. John. Oh, John. You mean murder? Yes, Nancy. Exactly. Oh, stop it, John. Why, that's absurd. You've been listening to too many radio listeners. It's not absurd. I'm serious. And I can get away with it, too. Look out, your glass. <laughs> John, you've spilled uh, your drink. It's all over this book. Robert Louis Stevenson kidnapped. Oh, I bet this will make your Uncle William happy. Kidnapped? Nancy. Nancy, wait a minute. That's it. It's perfect. Kidnapped. Nancy... I've got an idea worth fifty thousand dollars, and it can't fail. Yes, because of a little thing. Because you spilled a drink, you've got an idea, John. An idea to kidnap yourself and collect your own fifty thousand dollar ransom. Nancy was skeptical at first. But at last, she, too, saw the cleverness of your plan to be both kidnapper and victim. Far into the night, you developed your scheme carefully. The first step was to be threatening letters, planted where the susceptible Ellen would find them. And two weeks later, you watched the successful progress of your plan. Uncle William, Uncle William. Well, what is it? What is the matter, Ellen? Look, another letter. No. I was going through the pockets of John's suit, the one that's going to clean us. And I found... Let me see. Hmm. The time is near, John Haynes. You have been warned. Uh, just like the others. Letters cut from newspapers and pasted on a sheet of cheap paper. Uncle William, we must do something about these letters. If anything ever happened to John... No, uh, no, no. All right, my dear. <laughs> These are nothing but crank notes. I've been getting similar ones all my life. Well, well good morning, my dear. Hello, Uncle William. Hey, what's going on here? Ellen just found another of those notes. What? <laughs> Blasted, I thought I burned that. I didn't want to worry you, Ellen. I'm terribly sorry. But I still say it's nothing to get excited about. Oh, John, Uncle William. Isn't either of you going to do anything? Please hire a bodyguard or something. Don't be silly, Ellen. I agree. Calm down, my dear. John, I'm sure these threats are nothing serious, but for Ellen's sake, you'll be careful. Yes, you would be careful, John. Because now you are ready. You told Ellen and Uncle William that you were working hard on a new painting. That you would stay on the yacht all night. Then you called Nancy. And when she arrived, you went over the final plan with her in detail. It's working to perfection, Nancy. Ellen is frantic. 
When I turn up missing, she'll get that 50,000 ransom out of Uncle William in no time. I'm sure it's best to do it tonight, too. Positive. Now, you'll meet me at 7 o'clock sharp. It'll be dark by then. I'll be here. I'll drive out by the back road and pick you up at the end of the pier. Good. Now, I've checked the watchman's rounds. He stops here every four hours at 6, 10, and 2. Yes. Now, he won't see me leave, but he'll discover I'm missing at 10. Oh. I'll plan a ransom note in here and tip over the furniture, make it look good. What? What about a story to tell later? Oh, I'll have a dandy. Like, uh, that porthole there. I always leave it open. A, a masked man stood on the pier, stuck a gun through there, and made me unlock the door. And then his accomplice came in and got me. Fine, that'll work. Yeah, sure it will. But just one thing. You know that little filming station on the back road? I'll stop there and call me at 6.30. Oh? I'll be at the watchman's shack, just in case anything comes up on this end. You got it? I've got it. I'll see you tonight. I hope nothing goes wrong. It won't. I tell you, Nancy, this idea can't fail. Yes, you were sure of yourself, John. Confident that nothing could go wrong. But at that moment, unknown to you, your frantic wife, Ellen, was speaking by telephone to her brother, Gordon, in the city. Yes, yes, I found another letter. I know something terrible is going to happen. Gordon, you're the only one I can turn to. You must help me. All right, Ellen. I'll come out and talk to him. I may even have some good news for him, but I can't possibly make it before 11 tonight. 11? That's right. So I won't bother coming up to the house. I'll go directly to the yacht. Thus, John, without your knowledge, your brother-in-law, Gordon, would visit the yacht at 11 o'clock. That would not upset your plan if everything went according to schedule. But then I, fate intervened, and a little thing happened. It was almost 6.30, and Nancy was driving the back road, when suddenly a stray cat got it in front of her car. Oh! Oh! Holy smoke, lady. That was some bump. You all right? You hurt? Oh, no. No, I'm all right. I'm... A cat. It ran in front of me. Yeah, I saw it. You tried to turn and skid it into this tree. Mm. Mashed up your fender pretty bad. Oh, Knocked the wheel out of line, too. Well, can you fix it for me? I- I'm in a hurry. Well, won't look like much, but the car will run. Take me two, three hours, though. Quite a job. Two or three hours? Oh, good Lord. Do you have a phone? Oh, yes, ma'am. There's one in the gas station there. Oh, thanks. Thanks a lot. Nancy was distraught when she finally got you on the phone and told you of the delay. But you, John, were calm. You simply set your schedule ahead four hours. Eleven instead of seven. To again synchronize with the watchman's visit. And as far as you knew, nothing else was changed. Yes, you were confident. But soon, John Haynes, I will write again under your name in the Diary of Fate. We'll continue with a strange story of the John Haynes entry in just one moment. had been postponed. But now, with only ten minutes to wait, you checked your cabin on the yacht for the last time. The chairs you had overturned, the smashed lamp, the ransom note, everything was according to plan. At two minutes to eleven, you stepped out onto the fog-enshrouded deck. Then you heard a car approach. Nancy? Nancy, I, I was beginning to worry. Is everything all right? What's that, John? What did you say? Wait. Gordon. Oh, well, that's right. Flesh and blood, too. Relax, John. You look like you've seen a ghost. Do I? Well, it's hardly that, Gordon, but when you see my nerves are on edge. Oh, I... those threats, isn't it, John? Those crank letters? Wait. 
Yes. Yes, it is. How did you know about that? Oh, Ellen called me. She was all upset and insisted that I drop everything and come out here and play policeman. Policeman? <laughs> That's absurd. Uh, you're probably right, but since I'm here, I'd like to talk to you about something. It's probably raw out here in this fog. Can't we talk in the cabin? No. No, we can't. But, that is, I, I'd i like to get some fresh air. I've been working for hours. What is it you want to talk about? Well, it's a job, John. Commercial artist. You start at 85 a week, but in six months, maybe less, you'll be making twice that. I'm not in it, Gordon. Oh, you will be when you've heard all I have to say. Let's go below. I'm frozen. Come on, I'd boy him out on a night like this Gordon, and be on... Gordon, come here. Get your hands off me. Have you lost your mind? I'm not going into my cabin. Why, you... Oh. Come on, get up. Now we'll see what's so special in this cabin. What the... Look at this room. The chairs. It's new. Hmm. If you want to see John Haynes alive again, it will cost you $50,000. You will be... Con- very well, Gordon. What, John? John, you fool. You'll never get away with this. My dear brother-in-law is only one man's opinion. Help it, Nancy. I never expected him. Now, oh, come on. The night watcher must have heard those shots. We've got to get out of here. Yes, John. The little thing that had postponed your plan had also given you an opportunity for a job with the future. But you had preferred your original scheme. A scheme that now included murder. An hour later, you were safe in Nancy's apartment. And there you waited, confident that at that very moment, your wife was reacting as you had planned. Tell it, my dear, the sheriff only wants to do what's right. Yes, ma'am. The sheriff's office wants to cooperate, but paying the money at once may not be right. I don't care what's right or wrong. Here, here, Uncle William, listen to this again. You will be contacted. However, if the police interfere, John Haynes will be killed. Now, is that clear enough, is it? Of course it's clear, Ellen. Then there's only one thing left to talk about. Will you or will you not give me the money? I, uh... Yes, Ellen. I'll give it to you. Good. Thank you. I shall, please, you must understand our position. Hmm. Once John is back here, safe and sound, we'll work with you. But until then, you've got to stay out. You must. Very well, Mrs. Haynes, if that's the way you want it. Yes, as you had anticipated, John, your plan was working perfectly. But while you waited in Nancy's apartment, the minutes dragged by, you grew more and more restless. And Nancy's frantic questioning only increased your discomfort. John, did you have to kill him? Gordon's death, that's the one thing that scares me so. Forget it, Nancy. Gordon's death only strengthens our case. Strengthens it? What do you mean? Ellen was the only one who knew that Gordon was coming out to the yacht. I couldn't have framed that. And when I'm back, I'll tell them all how my brave brother-in-law surprised the kidnappers and tried to stop them. Oh, now it's time to call. But remember, Nancy, you're to say exactly what I told you. Not another word. Yeah. Yes, John, I know. Half of the $50,000 in unmarked 10s, 20s, and 50s. Wrap them in a package. Tomorrow night at midnight, drive past the library on Wilmont Boulevard. Then, without stopping, throw the package out. Fine. Fine, Nancy. Oh, now we're all set, darling. But, John, are you sure the police will... The police won't be within miles. You can count on Ellen for that. Even if they are, it won't matter much. What? I don't follow that. Look, I'm only John Haynes' kidnapper until I'm discovered, Nancy. But I'm just John Haynes, remember? The next day moved slowly for you, John. And when night finally settled over the city, you were relieved. At five minutes to twelve, you stood in the shadows of the deserted library building and waited with impatience. 
Soon the car would come by, and you would have your money. Then moments later, Nancy would drive past slowly, feigning motor trouble. Yes, John. It was all very simple. $50,000 package with Nancy as you stepped from her car unobserved and hailed a taxi cab. In another hour, you were at home in Bayville with your elated wife and Uncle William. Then, as the sheriff listened attentively, you told the detailed story of your kidnapping. Well, Sheriff, that's the long and short of it. I hope I haven't been too incoherent. To the contrary, Mr. Haynes. You've been very helpful, but that first part, the business on the yacht, uh, you said you were in your cabin working, is that right? Uh, yes. It was about 11 o'clock, maybe a few minutes before, when a man wearing a white handkerchief over his face appeared at the open porthole. He had a gun, and he threatened to kill me if I didn't do what he said. So you unlocked your cabin door as instructed. Yes. Then the other man, the one who had been standing next to him on the dock outside, came around and entered. But when did Gordon come in? A few minutes later. Both the gunmen were in the cabin by that time. But when they ordered Gordon to put up his hands, he started to swing. After that, I only remember the lamp on my desk breaking, then some shots. And then? I was hit from behind, and everything went black. Mm, I see. Tell me, Mr. Haynes, uh, would you recognize the kidnappers' voices if you heard them again? I'm certain I would, Sheriff. Especially the one who stood in the dock outside of my porthole. He had a definite southern accent. Good, good. Those details are important. Now, as a matter of fact, you have an unusual capacity for remembering details. Maybe the very thing that'll trap the kidnapper. Yes, John. The sheriff appreciated your capacity for remembering details. Details that you had rehearsed countless times in your own mind. But even as you listened to his words of confidence, your thoughts ran ahead to the day when you would have Nancy and the $50,000 you had so skillfully extorted. Yes, soon, John Haynes, you would have everything you wanted. And soon I, fate, will write the final entry under your name in the Diary of Fate. Before we bring you the last act in the story of John Haynes, here is our announcer. Now, John Haynes, your scheme to extort $50,000 was at last complete. You spent the next day in the privacy of your room, where you could be away from your overly attentive wife. But by late evening, you had grown restless. And when word came that the sheriff wanted to see you on the yacht, you welcomed the chance to return to the sympathetic role you played so well. Mr. Haynes, your wife and your uncle here have been very helpful in the past hour, but now it's a matter of details again particularly the first part, here aboard the yacht. But, Sheriff, John's been over that twice already. That's quite all right, Ellen. The Sheriff knows what he's doing. Now, what is it specifically? The time of the kidnapping. The exact time. I'd say it was about three or four minutes to eleven. You're sure of that? I'm positive. Well, in that case, I know who the kidnapper is. Don't you do? Do you know who the kidnapper is? Yes, Mr. Haynes, I do. It's eleven o'clock now... Forty-eight hours ago, almost to the minute, you kidnapped yourself. What? What did you say? No. No, you're lying. Am I? Remember the account you gave of the two men who stood on the dock, the one with the sullen accent who pointed a gun at you through the porthole? Yes. Yes, of course I remember. It was true. It happened. You're lying, Mr. Haynes. It couldn't have happened. Why not? 
Answer me. Why not? Just look at that porthole, Mr. Haynes. Look carefully and you'll see why. You'll see only the tar-stained side of the dock outside. Wait. What does that prove? That at 11 o'clock on the night of the kidnapping, as at 11 o'clock tonight, the tide was out. The yacht had settled accordingly. Then as now, your porthole, normally four feet above the dock, was flush against the side of the pier. No man, Mr. Haynes, could have stood there and pointed a gun at you. Yes, John Haynes. The constancy of both time and tide utterly destroyed your scheme for extortion. And hopelessly trapped, you revealed your guilt completely and thus condemned both yourself and Nancy Keith. And now it is time to close the book. Another entry has been duly recorded on the pages of eternity. And justice has been served. In the case of John Haynes, as in the cases of all mortals, I, fate, am but the instrument of a plan. And the countless little things that happen are the tools with which I work. Because of a spilled drink, John Haynes and Nancy Keith designed a scheme for evil. But because of another little thing, a stray cat that darted into the road, the execution of their scheme was postponed long enough for the tide to turn against them. Heed well, Lamar, you who listen and remember. There is a page for you in the diary of fate. Included in the cast were Herbert Litton, Lorene Tuttle, Benny Rubin, Tyler McVeigh, Mike Stewart, Lou Lane, Ray Earl.